Okay, so we're, we're counting lattice points in polytopes. What we've been talking about, and and today, what I want to discuss is a very important example. And this is the example of partition functions. <coughs> Bless you. So that's our topic for today. Okay. And uh, well, you, you might have already seen partition functions. And uh, maybe the, the most famous example is the example of uh, making change. So how many ways are there to make, to pay for n cents? How many ways? Are there to pay n cents with coins, with US coins? Okay. And US coins are one cent, or five cents, or ten cents, or twenty-five cents. And let's pretend that there's no. Well, no, there is. There are these dollar coins that you don't get to see very often, but they exist. Are there other ones that I haven't seen? Yeah? But I've never seen that, so I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but let's just. Did you get change from the transfer let's, let's say that we just have the, the, the usual coins that you always see. And uh, so this is a function of n. This is supposed to be an n here, n. And let's, let's say fn is the number of ways of doing this. Have you guys seen this question before? Yeah. So, but maybe you, maybe you saw it in a bit of a different context. Uh, but you see that the point is that if I decide that I have M1 pennies, M2 nickels, M3 dimes, and M4 quarters, and what I just said are the American names for these coins, then you're basically looking for, I mean, these are, these, these are integers, of course. And because they count the number of coins, then they should be non-negative. And of course, the number of cents that I have is m1 plus 5 m2 plus 10 m3 plus 25 m4. And so that, that should be equal to n, which is the number of cents, right? So what I'm looking for is, is the cardinality of this set, OK? And uh, well, now whenever you guys see a system of linear equations and inequalities, you should be thinking of a polytope, right? And this is exactly a polytope. Um, well, it's not exactly a polytope because we're looking at integer points, right? And so what we have is basically the number of points in the intersection of a polytope with the lattice z to the 4. Okay? And actually, I'm going to say that this is the polytope n times p, where p is the uh, polytope of uh, vectors in r to the 4, such that their coordinates are greater than or equal to 0. Okay, so that's bold phase. All, all are equal to zero, greater than or equal to zero. And we have this equality. Equal to one, right? So then when I scale that polytope by n, then I'm going to get this polytope and I'm counting lattice points in this polytope, okay? 
Um, what dimension is this polytope? What do you guys think? It lives in four dimensions, but is it four dimensional? It's, uh, it has one equation, right? And whenever you have an equation, that means that you're on a hyperplane. And if you're on just one equation, that means that you have, uh, you're three dimensional, okay? There's, th that's the only equality that, that is satisfied, so this is a three dimensional polytope, okay? So we're counting uh, lattice points in a three dimensional polytope and its scalings, okay? Okay. Now, I'm going to do something which, uh, if you're familiar with this, then it'll make perfect sense to you why I'm doing this. And if you're not familiar with this, then you're going to think that I'm kind of crazy, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I'm going to consider this. 1 over 1 minus z, 1 over 1 minus z to the fifth, 1 over 1 minus z to the tenth, and 1 over 1 minus z to the twenty-five. I'm going to consider that. That's a power series. When you, we, we can think of this as a power series that converges for, for a complex number z with norm less than 1. And let's just, uh, so 1 over 1 minus z is sum of z to the n. But let me be suggested, uh, suggestive, and instead of calling it n, let me call it m1. So that's the first one. Then this second geometric series is the geometric series of z to the 5. Okay. So I get this, and then I get this. And then I get this. Do we agree? Does that look good? So these are just the geometric ser series 1 over 1 minus whatever. Okay? So then I take all of these summations and I combine them into 1. So I'm summing over all m i is greater than or equal to 0. And I get z to the m1 times z to the 5m2 plus z to the 10m3 times z to the 25m4. So I get this, right? And then you see why I'm doing this if you have never seen this before. Um, this is a... The way that it looks right now, it's, it's, a, it's a huge power series that depends on four variables. But if, you, if we look at what the coefficient of z to the n is, then basically we're just asking ourselves, how many times is z to the n going to appear like this? And it's going to appear whenever you can find numbers m1 up to m4, which are greater than or equal to 0, and satisfy that this is equal to n. So then the number of times that z to the n is going to appear in this expression is exactly what we're looking for. Right? It's exactly f of n. Okay. And uh, so if you've never seen this before, I hope you think this is really cool. Right? Because it says we, we, we wanted to compute our function f of n, and it says that uh, the generating function is extremely explicit. We have it explicit. Okay. Now, can we actually use this to compute f of n? And again, I know some of you guys are taking the GRE soon, so this could be a GRE question. How would you do this? Given, given this equation, how do you compute f of n? Let me, let me say f of n is the coefficient of z to the n in something like this. And so the question is, how, how would you 
Well, I don't think this is a reasonable GRE question, but I think this is a good review <laughs> for um, how would you actually do this if, if you had a lot of time? Taylor series, but what, how do you do the Taylor series of this thing? There's a, there's a couple of ways. One way is that if you, if you multiply by z to the minus n, then you're looking at the coefficient of z to the 0. And how do you compute the constant coefficient of something like this? I'm sorry? But if you plug in 0, you're going to get, if, if you plug in 0, you're going to be dividing by, by 0. So one thing you can do is, is think that you're in complex analysis all of a sudden and do this, this contour integral business. Right. Or another thing you can do is think that you are in, in a very hard differential calculus class. And then if you were to take the derivative of this, then you would take uh, partial fraction decomposition. Right. So you can do this either, either by, by contour integration or by partial fractions and so let's let me just choose one I'm going to do it by partial fractions real quick okay minus so minus yeah yeah and if you want to see this done explicitly it's done in the book in, in the other way uh, if I were to do this by partial fractions, then I would have to say, well, this is equal to, let's call this big thing f of z. So what is the partial fraction decomposition of, of this thing? So it's, so it's something over 1 minus z plus something over, it's a little bit tricky, actually. That's why I'm saying that this is not exactly a GRE question. <laughs> because you, you want to kind of say, I mean, you can't exactly say this because this works when the when the denominators are are linear. And so the way that you do partial fractions is that you want to factor the bottom into linear things. So how do we factor something like one minus z to the fifth into linear things? Again, this is just review of a lot of things. What's the factorization of one minus z to the five? Basically, you're, you're solving the equation z to the 5 equals 1, and so this is where you, the complex, the complex uh, roots of unity come in, right? And what you get is uh, one, over, uh, 1 over, let's call this, this the fifth root of unity. Sorry, we don't know what the coefficients are, right? This, Second, third root of unity, fourth root of unity, fifth root of unity. So w five to the fifth, omega five to the fifth is one. Should I worry here? So the answer is I should. So why the thing is that in a partial fraction decomposition, you don't, you don't want to have two 1 minus z's, right? So if you have a second factor of 1 minus z, do you remember what you do? You have to consider this uh, like that. And, uh, and that's, that's just the, the, this term. But then you have to do the same thing for these guys, right? Which are the tenth the tenth roots of unity. So then you know you get something over tenth root of unity plus, and then you get ten of these things, and then something over twenty fifth root of unity, and so on. And then you you compute these coefficients, okay? 
And by the way, this is, this is a fair GRE question to ask you, what is this coefficient? And so because it's a fair GRE question, I'm not going to answer it. Uh, think about it. It's, it's, um, but you guys know, or you can remind yourselves how to compute each one of these coefficients. And then once you have this whole thing done, then you can, you can multiply each one of these things out and collect uh, the power of 0 to the n. So for example, if you want the power of 0 to the n here, that's not hard because this is a geometric series. Or here you can collect the power of 0 to the n, and so on. Okay. And so what you're going to get at the end is a formula, but a horrible formula. Okay. But it's a formula. And I mean, it's, it's, it's somehow the formula because that's just what the answer is. f of n is going to be a sum of, of a, a lot of things involving a lot of different roots of union. Okay. Um, and you can, see, you can see this done more explicitly in, in the book. But, uh, but I wanted to give you an idea of how this works and that if you really want to do this, then you have to review a little bit of, of uh, all of these things. Okay? But do you guys uh, understand what the general method is? I mean, there's, there's details to fill in, but, but, uh, but this can be done, basically. But so this maybe is, is what I want to highlight here. Well, I want to highlight two things. First, this, and this is, this is easy and very explicit. And then the other thing I want to highlight is that basically this is not so easy, and it takes some work, but it can be done. Okay. So that's the first example of a partition function. And these are called partition functions because they are, they are counting the number of ways of partitioning n into uh, ones, fives, tens, and twenty-fives. Okay, that's where the word partition comes. Okay. So, what is a partition function in general? It's some. It's something a little bit more general than this. So, but very similar. The thing is that in, instead of instead of having coins, you're going to have vectors. So in general, you're going to have some collection A, C1, up to Cn. And each one of these is a vector in in 0 to the d. OK? And then the partition function associated to this I'm going to denote it phi sub a of b. It's going to be the, the number of ways of writing a vector b as a sum of these guys. Is the number of, and let me say it, partitions of the vector b into vectors ci's. Okay, and let me now say it more precisely. phi sub a of b is the number of ways of choosing how many times you're going to use c1 dot 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 until how many times you're going to choose cn okay of course these should be integers they should be all greater than or equal to zero and they should satisfy that if you take m1 copies of the first vector, m2 copies of the second vector, until mn copies of the nth vector, then you get b. OK? So it's basically the, if you imagine a country where, where uh, the currency was in vectors, then this would be exactly it. Right? You have a, a coin of m1, a coin of m2, and so on. And of course, uh, this is also the number of lattice points in a polytope. Because again, these are, these are all uh, linear equalities and inequalities. So And 
Where does P? P is the P is the polytope of X is in R to the N such that uh, all the coordinates are greater than or equal to zero. And X1, C1 up to X N C N is equal to B. Okay. And remember our, our notation for this actually. is that this we write as a x equals b, right? Where we're thinking that a is the matrix whose columns are c1 up to cn. So this is going to be a, a d by n matrix. So do you guys have any questions so far? So I'm, I'm saying basically that whenever you want to solve one of these que uh, partition questions, that exactly amounts to computing the, the number of lattice points in a polytope like this. OK? Now let me, let me ask you a question that I'm not going to answer right now. This is a, maybe a good question for the forum. Uh, is this really an example, or is, is this kind of equivalent to computing lattice points in polytopes? The reason I say that is that in, in, the, in homework number two, you guys proved that um, any, any polytope can be expressed as the intersection of an affine subspace and a positive orthant. And here's a positive orthant, and here's an affine subspace. So, so my question to you is, is partition functions exactly the same thing as computing uh, lattice points in polytopes? Or are there uh, problems about counting lattice points in polytopes that are not about partition functions? In other words, what I'm asking is, clearly partition functions are a sub-problem of, of counting lattice points in polytopes. But are they the full problem, or are they really a sub-problem? So that's a good question for you to think about. And uh, maybe I shouldn't have erased what I just erased, but well, let's just do it. What I'm going to do is write the whole, write exactly what I just erased, but uh, now in this level of generality. So I'm going to try to make the same computation. Let me use the notation that if you have some integer vector b, then I'm then. I'm going to write, when I write something like z to the b, okay, then this is the same thing as z1 to the b1 and up to zd to the bd. Okay. I think this is clearest in an example. So when I write something like z to the 3, 4, 2, what I mean is z1 cubed, z2 to the fourth, Z3. Let's put a minus sign so you don't get scared of minus signs if you see them. Um, something like that. So that's my notation. Okay. And the reason that I want that notation is that if you remember what I what I just erased was that I wrote one over one minus z, one over one minus z to the fifth. So I use my coins as exponents. And so that's what I want to do here also. So let me use my coins as exponents and write the same thing that I wrote. Sorry, my coins are called C1 up to Cn. And so now I want to write this down, OK? And, uh, and then I just am going to make exactly the same computation, but 
But keep in mind that when I, when I say z to the c1, c1 is a vector. And so it's going to be something like this. Okay. But then I'm going to make the same computation because it, it's still true that, I mean, what is 1 over 1 minus a cubed b to the fourth c to the minus 2? Well, it's still a geometric series, right? It's still 1 over 1 minus something. And 1 over 1 minus something is still 1 plus something plus something squared etc and so I'm gonna do the same thing here 1 over 1 minus z to the c1 I'm just gonna write it as 1 plus z to the c1 plus z to the c1 squared etc It's still a geometric series. And I'm going to do that for each one of these guys. OK. And then it's just a matter of kind of getting the notation right. OK, so I'm going to write that this is sum of z to the c1 times m1, where m1 goes from 0 to infinity. And then this goes on until this is the summation of z to the cn times mn, where mn is greater than or equal to 0. So I get, I get these big summations. And then when I multiply them all together, I'm going to get a very big summation over all vectors m greater than or equal to 0. And then I'm going to get z to the c1 m1 times z to the c2 m2, etc. That's what happens when I merge all these summations. Um, then the next thing that you should notice is that even in, in this vector notation, it, it's still true that z to the a times z to the b is z to the a plus b. So you have to think about that for a second. Uh, Take x to the 1 comma 1 times x to the 2 comma 3. Why is that x to the 3 comma 4? Think about it, convince yourself. Um, and then you can write the next step. And then I get this huge summation where, again, if I want to know what the coefficient of b is, if I want to know what, z, what the coefficient of z to the b is, then I have to figure out how many choices of m's are there that give me c1 m1 plus dot 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 plus c n m n equal to b. So the number of ways, the number of times that z to the b is going to appear in this computation is exactly the, the number of partitions of b into m1 up to mn. So what I get here is exactly phi sub a of b. Okay. And if you look at this computation and the one that I just erased, I, I just took 1, 2, 5, 10, and I changed it for ai. So the computation is exactly the same. And the, the only subtlety is just keeping track of what what happens when you now take this this uh, z to a vector? But then, but then you you can see that nothing really happens. It, the same argument works. And so, what I want to conclude then, let's write this as a theorem, is that phi 
sub a of b is the coefficient of z to the b in, in that big thing. Do you guys have any questions about that? So, so what, what this has basically is that uh, these partition functions have very, very simple uh, generating functions. So, but uh, of course, I mean, you, I already raised how the, the trouble of the computation when the coins were worth 1, 2, 5, and 10. Um, and here it's going to be more complicated than that. In particular, you have to think about how you're going to factor something like this. I mean, if you, if you think that, I mean, if you want to factor 1 minus 0 to the 10, maybe that's not too bad. Uh, but now, really what we're factoring is something like 1 minus z1 to the 10, z2 to the 7, z3 to the 4. Okay, you you want to factor that into linear things. A lot, of, a lot of issues arise, okay? So, in a sense, this says that phi of sub a of b is not too bad, but in a sense, actually, it is too bad. Okay? So, it's... Um, so this is a nice formula, but in practice, it's not that great. I mean, it's you can work with it, but but in practice, there's a lot more to be said about this. So in theory, this looks simple, but in practice, if you actually want to compute these things, it's a lot more complicated. But it's also a lot, a lot more beautiful than this. In practice, there's a, there's a lot of nice things that that, uh, that you can do. We need we need more tools, and there's there's different ways of doing this. So, for example, one one thing is to bring in complex analysis machinery and uh, use tools from re residue theory. Um, there's a nice algebraic machinery that you can use. There's a lot of nice combinatorics that you can use. Um, but what I what I want to maybe emphasize is that already, already for this question, this is this is very interesting and fairly open. There's there's a lot of things that are not fully known about this. Okay. So there's there's several open things to understand here. Okay. And um, so maybe what I'll do now is, is discuss with you uh, a particular example of this. So I mean, we, we talked about the, the case of the coins. And then you see that actually the, the kinds of things that arise there are they have to do a lot with number theory. They have to do a lot with the complex roots of unity and how they, how they, you know, how do you take these big expressions that have a lot of complex roots of unity and somehow make an integer out of them? Um, I want to show you a different example that it, that has less to do with number theory and more to do with combinatorics. So that'll be our example number two. And that's going to be the example where you take the following vector configuration. You're going to take the vectors of the form EI minus EJ, where 1 is less than or equal to I less than J less than or equal to N. Okay? 
And then you want to know, basically, given a vector b, how many ways are there to write it as a linear combination of, of these things? OK? Now, if some of you have taken or are taking any course in, in uh, either Lie groups or Lie algebras or Coxeter groups or many different other fields, then you'll recognize this. So what, what is this called? You? This is the this is the this is called a, a root system of um, either SLN or the Coxer, the symmetric group. The the point is that this is really uh, something that comes from representation theory, and if this is something that interests you, then this is really where this comes from: the representation theory of Lie algebras. But I'm not going to assume that you know anything about this. But what I, what I want to assure you is that you, if you want to be able to compute in the representation theory of Lie algebras, then you need to be able to say some things about this function. This function is extremely important in that theory. And so let's, let's do this very concretely. Let's, let's, let's see what this function looks like maybe for for A3. Okay. So what are the vectors in, in A3? They are E1 minus E2, E1 minus E3, E1 minus E4, 2 minus E3, E2 minus E4, and E3 minus E4. Right? And uh, here, e, EI is uh, the unit vector in the direction I. Okay? So these are. These are in R4. OK? Now, I think you've noticed in this class that some, we, we keep seeing things that look like they cannot be drawn, but we're stubborn and we decide to, that we can do it anyway. And this is an example of such a thing. In principle, it looks like this is a four-dimensional picture. right? Is it really four-dimensional? Well, if I'm asking Paul, the answer is no. So why is it, why is it no? Can you, can you see why the answer is no? If you, if you look at every one of these points, what, what, if, you, if you notice, they all lie on the same uh, hyperplane, which is the hyperplane where all the coordinates are add up to 0. I mean, let's, let's make this very, very concrete. Th these points are the points 1 minus 1, 0, 0. Um, 1, 0 minus 1, 0. 1, 0, 0 minus 1. 0, 1 minus 1, 0. 0, 1, 0 minus 1. 0, 0, 1 minus 1. Okay? So you notice that in all of them, the coordinates add up to 0, which means that really they live in the, hi in the hyperplane x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 equals Zero. So that's so they're really living in a three-dimensional thing, okay? Now the other thing that I want to point out. To, so so let's imagine that I'm going to draw a three-dimensional picture here. Actually, I'm, I'm going to draw a bigger picture. So let's do it over here. And I want you to think about how how these things look in three dimensions. I mean, these are just six vectors in a three-dimensional space, so it's so we should be able to draw them. So this is R four intersected with uh, the hyperplane X such that X one plus X two plus X three plus X four equals zero. Now, if you want to be able to draw this, you, you know that it, it kind of comes to what are the relations between them, right? For example, can you see two that are on the same line? Are any of these multiples of each other? No, right? I mean, if I call them E12 and so on. None of these are multiples of each other. Can you find three that are in the same plane? Can you find any relations between three of them? Is 
the first two, so E12, E13, and E23. And you're telling me those are dependent. That's absolutely right, because E12 plus E23 equals E13. So that means that if I draw here E12, and if I draw here E23, and if I draw here the origin, then where is E13? It's, it's twice this point. Do we agree? So this is like E13 over 2. So that when you take E12 plus E23, you basically have to complete this this parallelogram, right? And then this is E13. Do we agree? So we're saying E12 plus E23 equals E13. Can you tell me other coincidences here? Second, third, so this is E14 and sixth, which is E34. So you're telling me E13, E14, and E34 are also lining up. Let me do a, an easier one, and then we'll go to yours. Okay? So you told me this, this, what? E13, E14, and E34. An easier one is, is these three. E23, E24, E34. Because, again, E23 plus E34 equals E24. So that means that if I draw... E34, then the midpoint is going to be E24 over 2. Okay? Now you told me E13, E14, E34. So that means that E13, E34, and E14 are lined up, right? So you're telling me that E14 is somewhere over here. It's actually like, if you, if you do the computation, this is E14 over 3, OK? But it's basically saying that these three vectors are on the same plane. Any other coincidences? Try to draw it suggestively so you can see the other one. So that E12 plus E24 is E14. If you see what I'm saying really is that EAB plus EBC is EAC. Which, when you put it like that, it, it makes more sense. And uh, it, it accounts for all the, all the dependencies. Okay? So this looks like this. OK? Now, I, you see the, the reason that I'm Drawing it like this is just so that I'm able to draw it. So this, this, this blue thing that I just drew is the cone generated by these six vectors. Right? Now really, like I said, E13 is kind of out here. E24 is maybe out here. But the point is that the cone they generate is right there. OK? And so what I'm saying now is I, I want to write points as linear combinations of these six vectors that I see here. Okay. So for example, I think you'll agree that if I ask you to write a vector back here as a positive combination of those guys, you're not going to be able to do it. Right? Because if you take positive combinations of these things, then you're going to be staying inside this cone. So the function is 0 outside of the cone. Now. If I ask you to write a vector like this, 
a vector over here as a combination of these of these six vectors, then what could it be a combination of? For example, it could not be a combination of this, this, and this. Because a combination of this, this, and this is in that part of the cone, not in this part of the cone. Okay? And so that means that the, the ways of writing a vector as a, as a combination of these six guys basically depends on how, on how this picture looks. Okay? And how... Let me draw some more, some more slices. Depending on what region I have here, you're going to be able to be written in, in different ways or not in different ways. Okay? And uh, so it turns out, and I'm, I'm just going to tell you what the, what the answer is, but basically, if you, if you want to compute this function phi sub a3 of b, it's, it's a function of b1, b2, b3, and b4. Okay? But that function depends on where b lives. If, it, if you're outside the cone, the function is 0. And if you're inside this cone, then it depends on, on what part you live in. Okay? And I'm only showing you a, a, a two-dimensional slice because I don't want to, if, I want to draw a picture that I can draw. But really, this is kind of a three-dimensional picture, right? Everything is coned, okay? And so then I'll just tell you what the, fo what the formulas look like. So for example, if you are right here, if B is in chamber 1, then the formula looks like this. P sub A3 of B is B1 plus B2 plus B3 times B1 plus B2, sorry, plus 2. B1 plus B2 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1 over 6. That's the formula. Okay. It's a very explicit formula, and it's kind of surprising that the formula is so explicit, because so far, the only way that we have of computing formulas is through this, this very complex uh, procedure here. And I mean complex in the sense of difficulty and complex in the sense of complex analysis also. I didn't mean to do that, but anyway. So that's the formula in, in that chamber. Okay, we call this a, a chamber if, if you're, if the vector B lives in this region. You see, for example, that it only depends on the first two coordinates of B. That's kind of interesting, and it's true. Okay. Uh, if you're in in this region, then the formula looks different. B one plus one, B one plus two, B one plus. 3b2 plus 3 over 6. Okay. So that's another beautiful formula, very simple, for the number of ways of writing b as a function of these guys. Okay. So then you might be tempted to think that the formulas are always really nice, but that turns out to be very far from true. So if you're in this region, 3 right here, then the formula looks different. And it's just a very, it's a big sum. It starts like 1 plus 11 sixths times b1 plus dot, 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 dot. It's a huge thing, minus a half b3 cubed. And there are 12 terms here. And this thing doesn't factor. Okay. And so this is, the, this is the kind of phenomena that you see that, that are, are very strange. Depending on where you are, there are some places where the formulas are beautiful. There are some places where the formulas are very ugly. Um, but the, I want to basically tell you what is known and what is not known about this. And, and I think that if, if you're in, interested in a, thesis, in, a, in a project for the class, this is an interesting topic. Um, it is known that this function phi a of b always has this kind of general shape. So there's always a cone. Outside of the cone is 0. And inside of the cone, it kind of uh, splits, splits up into different pieces. And inside each piece, it, there is a formula. Um, it's not known why these formulas are so nice a lot of the time. And there's some really beautiful formulas that are, can be proved but not fully explained. Okay? And again, you should be surprised 
especially when you see what, what the formulas generally look like, because generally they look like this. But there are some nice chambers where they look like this. And it's an interesting question to explain why, what makes those, cha those chambers so special. Okay? Uh, for example, there, there, are, there are times, and you cannot see it in this picture because it doesn't happen in this picture, but there are times where, even though it looks like they should have different answers, two neighbor chambers have the same answer. And that's not really understood either. Why, why is that? And, and how can we explain that? Okay. So, so these are some of, the, some of the things that are open. Okay. Um, but th but there, are, there are very nice methods for dealing with this. For example, there, there are explicit formulas that tell you. I mean, for example, how do you compute this? The, the way that you can compute it is that there is one region where the formula is known to be nice. And it's this region, I believe. In this region, the formula is known to be nice for any value of n. And then there are formulas that tell you, when you cross a wall, how does the formula change? So for example, there is a formula that tells you, when you cross from 1 to 2, how does this function change to become this one? And there is an explicit formula that tells you, what do you have to do to this function to get this one? Okay. And so that means that you can kind of start somewhere that there's a nice formula, and then just kind of walk around this picture and give formulas for all the regions. And that's so one of the best methods known for computing these, and, but you'll realize that it's not so easy. Okay? But that's the best thing available. Um, and that's basically the state of the art. I mean, there are some other things that we know, but not much more. And so I think this is a, this is a good uh, starting point for a question that is, I think is fairly understandable. It's very important because it's really important in this representation theory of, of the algebra. And there are nice things to, to say about it. Um, so we'll stop there, and uh, I'll tell you more about lattice point counting next time. Okay. Actually, maybe one thing that, that I would like to say just really quick is that there's also an explicit combinatorial interpretation for this. Let me just tell you real quick. Um, no, I don't want to keep you guys late, actually. But you can read about it in the notes. But basically, the, this is the number of ways of, of putting flows in a, in a system of, of uh, if you think about the complete graph as being a sort of a, a, a system of, of water pipes, then this is the number of ways of, of, putting, of kind of letting water flow through that diagram in, in a certain way. 